July 5th, 2009. After one of the resort's busiest days of the year, two monorails are on a collision course. Monorail Purple is stopped on the track while a second train is heading straight towards it. After the violent collision, several persons aboard Monorail Purple are injured, the pilot fatally. How did this collision occur? Was the cause technical, mechanical, or human in nature? What went wrong? Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those vital seconds from disaster. Investigators now interview Monorail Guest Service Manager David Gilmore, who was in the role of Monorail Central Coordinator at the time of the accident. Gilmore informs NTSB investigators that ordinarily guest service managers do not fill the role of coordinator, though they are well qualified to do so if needed. Investigators learn that coordinator Bob Hant was the role of Monorail Central that evening. He had requested to leave early because he was feeling very ill, and manager David Gilmore approved that request. This was the reason that David Gilmore was in the role of Monorail Central Coordinator at the time of the accident. When Gilmore authorized Bob Hant's request for an early release, Gilmore was in the midst of a meal break, off property, at a local restaurant. He would remain off property filling the role of Monorail Central Coordinator through the time of the accident. It was Gilmore, in the role of coordinator, who called shop panel operator Mike Carr, requesting the movement of switch beams 8 and 9 to the spur line with power. When shop panel operator Carr called back to confirm, Gilmore gave the affirmative. He was not at his panel, so he could not see that beams 8 and 9 were not properly aligned. Still, although several miles from the park, temporary coordinator Gilmore called back train Pink, advising him to move his train in reverse through switch beams 8 and 9. It is at this time that Rubino put his train in reverse and begun his 15 miles per hour journey. Less than a minute later, Gilmore could only hear static on his radio. The investigators receive autopsy results for 21-year-old pilot Austin Wunnenberg. They are consistent with injuries that might have been caused by a monorail collision, and include blunt force trauma to the head and torso, consistent with traumatic compression. Investigators also review raw data from the ride and trains themselves. They confirm that the MAPO override switch had been activated on monorail pink as authorized, but find that the shop panel control for switch beams 8 and 9 had not been activated. As a result, beams 8 and 9 would remain in position on the spur track, allowing Monorail Pink to reverse through the station entirely on the spur track where Monorail Purple was holding short. This rules out the possibility of a mechanical failure and points to a fatal combination of human error. In addition to the cause of the accident, the findings will prompt new safety enhancements to Disney's monorail system. Now, based on the National Transportation Safety Board's findings, we can go back to that fateful night and find out exactly how that fatal accident came to be. We now can put together the pieces, unravel the critical chain of events, and prepare to count down those vital seconds from disaster. July 4th, 6 a.m., 20 hours to disaster. Monorail Pink is put into service where it joins purple, silver, red, and blue. Seven hours to disaster. Alan Rubino clocks in for his shift, which will last 12 and a half hours. He will have worked 51 hours by week's end. Three hours to disaster. Shop panel operator Michael Carr clocks in for his overnight shift. He will handle switch duties and clearances as the monorails head back to the maintenance bay for storage overnight. Two and a half hours to disaster. Austin Wunnenberg clocks in for his four-hour closing shift. Thirty minutes from disaster. Monorail Central Coordinator Bob Hant advises his manager David Gilmore by radio 
that he is feeling ill. Gilmore, who is in the middle of a meal break off property, grants the coordinator's request to leave early, meaning David Gilmore now assumes the role of monorail central coordinator until he is able to procure a replacement. Gilmore will remain in the position as Monorail Central Coordinator, operating from an off-property restaurant and away from the Monorail Central console, for the next 35 minutes. 1.35 a.m. 25 minutes to disaster. Humidity creeps up to the 90% level, making visibility low and conditions looking out from the inside of a monorail train almost impossible. 1.45 a.m. 15 minutes to disaster. Three trains move into position to transfer between tracks along the monorail system. A fourth train is waiting to enter the shop. 1.47 a.m. 13 minutes to disaster. Ailing monorail central coordinator Bob Hand clocks out for the day, having received permission from his supervisor. The Walt Disney World monorail system is now officially without a designated coordinator. 1.49 a.m. 11 minutes to disaster. Monorail Silver contacts shop panel operator Mike Carr, requesting to transfer tracks through Switchbeam 3 using the Mapo override button. The request is approved. 1.51 a.m. 9 minutes to disaster. Monorail Red is instructed by panel operator Carr to use Mapo Override while advancing to Pylon 62. Red is to hold short at this location. 1.53 and 5 seconds. 6 minutes, 55 seconds to disaster. Monorail Pink contacts Interim Central Operator and Guest Service Manager David Gilmore. Pink has passed through Block Zone 379 and is granted clearance forward to Pylon 30. Six minutes and 34 seconds to disaster. Monorails Red, Blue, and Silver simultaneously contact shop panel operator Michael Carr, once again requesting three different transfers. He clears all three. Six minutes, 11 seconds to disaster. Monorail Purple, driven by Captain Wannenberg, receives instructions from Monorail Central Coordinator David Gilmore to hold short at Block Zone 379. Alan Rubino's Monorail Pink had passed 379 only minutes earlier. 154 and 50 seconds, 5 minutes, 20 seconds to disaster. Temporary Coordinator Gilmore instructs Shop Panel Operator Carr to power and activate switch beams 8 and 9 so that Pink may switch to the main line. 155 AM. Five minutes to disaster. Monorail Silver contacts shop panel operator Carr with an alarm received as Silver passed through the shop door. Operator Carr cannot trace the alarm due to radio static. Monorail Silver, having told Carr the alarm was on the left side, retracts the previous statement. 157 and 8 seconds. 2 minutes, 52 seconds to disaster. Temporary Central Coordinator Gilmore contacts Shop Panel Operator Carr, inquiring as to the status of switch beams 8 and 9, which should have been activated when requested at 1.54 a.m. Carr, distracted by the door alarm transmission from Monorail Silver, and unable to visually confirm the switch beam's positions due to a malfunctioning camera, mistakenly responds the switches have been activated. 1.57 and 30 seconds. 2 minutes, 30 seconds, to disaster. Central Coordinator Gilmore, unable to verify the position of switch beams 8 or 9, because he is not at the Monorail Central panel, instructs Monorail Pink Pilot Rubino to reverse his monorail through switch beams 8 and 9, which have not been activated and are still set on the spur line. 1.59 and 15 seconds. 45 seconds, to disaster. Pink Pilot Rubino activates the Mapo override and begins his reverse at 15 miles per hour. 159 and 20 seconds, 40 seconds to disaster. Monorail Purple advises Central he is holding short at Block Zone 379 on the spur line. Unaware that Monorail Pink is still on the spur line, 
Temporary Central Coordinator Gilmore instructs Monorail Purple Pilot Wunnenberg to advance to Spur Zone 385, activate the Maypo Override Control, and advance into the Ticket Center Station Concourse. 159 and 59 seconds, 2 seconds to disaster. Monorail Pink advances through the Ticket Center Station Concourse, still on the Spur Line. At 2 a.m. and 1 second, with switch beams 8 and 9 not in proper position, and no person manning the Monorail Central Console to see that beams 8 and 9 are not in place, Monorail Pink remains on the Spur Line, travels through the Ticket Center Station at 15 miles per hour, and strikes Monorail Purple, which, having just begun its desperate reverse, has only reached 2 miles per hour prior to the collision. In late 2009, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration fined Disney $35,200 for several safety violations. First, Disney failed to follow monorail manufacturer Bombardier's recommendation that a spotter be used to watch the back of any monorail train traveling in reverse. Disney has since corrected the problem, adding a spotter to every monorail train at any point in which a train might travel in reverse. When manager David Gilmore authorized the scheduled monorail coordinator to go home because he was feeling ill, no replacement coordinator was assigned to fill the role. In of itself, Gilmore was found to be more than capable of handling the coordinator's responsibilities, but complications arose by his taking a meal break off property during the time of the incident. In the future, coordinators were required to remain on property at the central console so they may verify beam positioning during transfer activity. Disney updated its monorail maintenance personnel and shop operation training curriculum to include detailed descriptions and instructions for the panel that controls track switches. After their leave, none of the three involved and suspended employees would return to work the monorail. However, guest service manager David Gilmore returned to Disney in another capacity, as did shop panel electrician Michael Carr. The pilot of Monorail Pink, Alan Rubino, however, opted not to return. 21-year-old pilot Austin Wunnenberg's family settled their lawsuit against Disney for an undisclosed amount, alleging this tragedy caused by human error could and should have been prevented. <laughs>